turn the program over to Suba. Suba, it's yours. Well, thank you, Trudy. Uh, you always make it so entertaining when people are joining in. I even saw one person say, hey, she's calling ARP Virginia to become a volunteer. So uh, great, fantastic. We'd love to have great people uh, join us. Uh, but anyway, folks, good afternoon. Uh, I could be maybe morning where you are. I know people join us from all over the country sometimes, sometimes from even overseas. So different, depending on what time you're on, welcome to the Tuesday Explorers a series of lifelong learning opportunities brought to you by ARP Virginia. So thank you for joining us today. I'm Suba Sadi, an ARP Volunteer Community Ambassador with ARP Virginia here in Fairfax Station, Virginia, to be exact. ARP is here to make your voice heard and provide information and resources on the issues that matter and to connect you with fun learning opportunities. We provide valuable educational, informational, and fun resources, things like web webinars, teleton halls, discounts, and more. I'd like to thank my co-host and helper today, Trudy Maroda. Like me, Trudy is a volunteer community ambassador with ARP Virginia. She will be monitoring the Q&A box and will facilitate the Q&A portion of our program. We will have time for Q&A at the end of today's presentation, so please submit your questions and our comments in the Q&A box. We expect the program to last for about an hour. During Black History Month and beyond, ARP wants to shine a spotlight on local leaders who have helped their communities survive and thrive. I am excited about our program today as I am a huge fan of college basketball and sports in general. Today, we're exploring the life and times of Dr. Edwin B. Henderson who has been called the father of black basketball. Dr. Henderson was the first to establish the infrastructure by which African-Americans went from exclusion from basketball to full participation and in integration of the sport. We're most fortunate to have his grandson, Edwin B. Henderson II, with us today to tell us about his grandfather. Edwin B. Henderson II is a local Falls Church, Virginia, community historian and has a rich biography that would take the entire program to read. So I'm only gonna share a few highlights. He has been an educator for 25 years and retired from Fairfax County Public Schools in 2010. He's a founder member of the Tinner Hill Heritage Foundation, a local nonprofit created to correct and reinsert the African-American presence into our shared history. And if you wanna know more about this organization or Dinner Hill, I encourage you to watch a recording of our program from last week. Mr. Henderson serves on several boards, including the Falls Church Historical Commission. And finally, he is married to an amazing woman, Nikki Graves. Together they will, to, uh, Nikki unfortunately cannot join us today. So Edwin will share the early history of the birth of black basketball, as well as the fascinating journey they undertook that led to Dr. Henderson's induction into the Basketball Hall of Fame. It is my sincere pleasure to turn the program over to Edwin B. Henderson. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Edwin. And Edwin, the screen is yours, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, the grandfather of black basketball was a term that Nikki and I coined when we were um, nominating E.B. Henderson to the Basketball Hall of Fame. Uh, that was in 2005. And, uh, and he was inducted into the class uh, of 2013 into the Hall of Fame. Um, the reason why we said grandfather of Black basketball was because there were at least two other people that were known as the father of black basketball, even though E.B. Henderson preceded them both by at least 20 years. So he must have been their grandfather. And then we, therefore we did not use the term grandfather a third time, but rather coined a new phrase and that was grandfather of black basketball. And, um, 
what E.B. Henderson did was that he was the first to introduce in 1904 the game of basketball to African Americans on a wide scale organized basis in, in the nation during the era of abject Jim Crow segregation. Okay, this is the birthplace of E.B. Henderson. Um, he was born on School Street in Southwest Washington, D.C., near the uh, Wharf area, and in the home of his grandmother, Eliza Henderson. This is a picture, a very young image of uh, E.B. and his mother, Louisa, and his brother, William. Edwin is, uh, E.B. is the one with the hat standing, and uh, this is a very great picture um, that I really like. This is a young E.B. Henderson. At this time, I think he's around 20, give or take. And E.B. attended the M Street High School, which was uh, the first, one of the first high schools in the nation. Um, and he graduated in 1902 with honors. Um, Anna J. Cooper was his principal. And this school started in uh, various places around, uh, particularly in the 15th Street Presbyterian Church basement starting out around 1870. Um, it was supported by the um, Washington DC School Board, but, and they created a colored school system in 18, uh, in the 1880s. And on the left, you have M Street. And on the right is the more majestic Dunbar High School, which was built, oh, 1917. After graduating from uh, M Street, he enrolled in a Miners Teachers College, normal school number two. Uh, normal school number one was for whites and normal school number two was for colored students. Um, Henderson again would graduate as valedictorian number one in his class. And he had dreams of becoming a doctor. So he applied to the Howard Medical School, uh, but night classes were discontinued in 1907, dashing his hopes of becoming a doctor. One of the reasons why he wanted to become a doctor was because he wanted to be able to afford um, a lifestyle which um, Mary Ellen Henderson, who he met at Miners Teachers College, and was the love of his life. He wanted to go to med school because he wanted to be able to provide for her uh, in the middle class fashion that she was accustomed to. E.B. Henderson came up very meagerly. Um, at first he was born in the home that you saw there, which was rather a shanty. Then his parents moved to Pittsburgh, hoping to find uh, better employment and then back to Washington, DC. But he was not in the same social class as, as uh, Mary Ellen. Um, and they made uh, pet names for themselves. They were known as Ned and Nell. So at Miners Teachers College, uh, uh, Ned, um, he met um, Mary Ellen or Nell, and uh, it was over an assignment that she needed some help on, and he offered some help. He came in and helped her with the assignment, and then she invited him to come call on her at her home on 13th Street sometime. They were married for 66 years and raised two sons in the family picture you see there. Um, on the left, you see my father, J James or Jimmy. Then you see Nell. 
then you see Ned, and that's my uncle Edwin, but not Edwin Bancroft. He's an Edwin Merriweather Henderson, so he was not a junior. And so when I became uh, named after my grandfather, I wasn't a junior either, I became a second. After attending Miners Teachers College, um, E.B. Henderson went to uh, Harvard summer sessions, the years of 1904, 05, and 07, missing 06 because of a lot of the work that he was doing with his league, which he had just formed. Um, he would go there to receive his certification to teach physical education in the Dudley Sargent School of Physical Education, or sometimes it was called physical training. This is his class picture. And if you look, um, he's, he's situated in the top right-hand corner standing. It wouldn't be until 1907 that he was able to take a seat <laughs> in the class picture. And on the right, you see the symbol for the uh, Sargent School of Physical Education. And the reason why he was missing the year 1906 was because in 1906, he organized the first athletic competition of the Interscholastic Athletic Association. It was a track meet held at Howard University. And this photo shows the games committee, many of which were members of the Eastern Board of Officials. Eastern Board of Officials were um, uh, referees, timekeepers, um, and all of the other things that go into actually running uh, competitions. EB is right there in the center. You probably can recognize him. Another thing that happened in uh, around that same time was that um, the New York uh, New York basketball was being becoming very popular in New York City. And so um, EB, who formed Washington's League in 1906, uh, arranged to compete against the New York League, the Olympian League, to form a national championship series against the League of uh, Henderson and the League of these two gentlemen. Um, and one of them is uh, uh, George Lattimore, who was the manager of the smart set of Brooklyn. And the other gentleman in the top right is Conrad Norman, who was the manager of the Physical Culture Club and they were both New York teams. Many of the New York teams were able to play in regulation facilities, whereas the facilities here in Washington were subpar, mainly because of segregation and the fact that there was no money to build regulation courts so that um, Black people could play the game of basketball. Basketball being a sport that is a winter sport um, needed inside facilities. So it was, uh, they played at the True Reformers Hall on U Street. Um, they called their championship series, it was to the Colored Basketball World Championship. World Championship, mind you. Uh, the first two years of the championship, uh, Washington's team in Henderson's League lost. The Crescent Club was, was the team that uh, competed against the New York teams and they lost. Whereas in 1908, Henderson formed this team here and captain the uh, Washington YMCA 12th Streeters. Um, and they 
played all of the teams. They went undefeated the whole season and they captured the Colored Basketball World Championship for the season 1909-1910. Wedding bells for Chris, on Christmas Eve, 1910. Um, Mary Ellen and E.B. were married on Christmas Eve at the 15th Street Presbyterian Church. On the right, you see their certificate of marriage. There are no um, photos in the church that I could find, but this picture of them was briefly after they were married and were here in Falls Church, where they moved to. Um, they got married and then they hopped on the train and went to New York. They didn't have money for a honeymoon, so they figured they would spend the weekend in New York during the time of this championship game, which took place. Um, Ned promised Nell that he'd retire from basketball after they were married. And that was largely because he would need to give up something because she would have to retire from teaching in the colored school, in DC colored schools. That was because that's the way things were back in those days. A woman, once she was married, could no longer teach. And so she made um, EB promised that he would have to give up basketball. They moved to Falls Church to raise a family, initially living with EB's parents and grandmother, Eliza, who owned a grocery store. And this was from uh, the front yard of her house, which was right at the center of town next to the Falls Church, for which the name the name of the town, which, for which the town is named. Also during this time, uh, after basketball, E.B. devoted a more time to chronicling the, um, the endeavors of African-Americans in sports. He was able to negotiate a deal with Spalding uh, publishers, the American Sports Publishing Company, um, around 1909. And this was the first time that a Spalding manual had pictures of Black teams in it. Um, this is also probably the first time that uh, the pursuits of African Americans in sports was chronicled. It was the first publication to highlight teams of African Americans just in organized sports, highlighting his efforts in creating the Eastern Board of Officials, which was the first organization to train officials, the Interscholastic Athletic Association, which was the model and the mold for which all athletic associations or leagues would then follow, and also about the Public School Athletic League or the PSAL. This was the first time a school system had an, a school league. And this was around 1910, 1911. The New York City um, PSAL was established in 1903 by a man named Luther Gulick. And he's all, Gulick is also the one that gave charge to James Naismith to start to invent the game of basketball. He told him to invent a winter sport, a sport that could be played between baseball, which was America's pastime, and football. Also at that time, uh, the second year of the Crisis Magazine, which is the um, magazine for the NAACP, uh, Henderson published this article, 
the colored college athlete. In this article, he, he told about the, how African Americans were going to not only HBCUs, but also teams like the gentleman here on the front cover um, was a quarter miler that attended Penn, University of Pennsylvania. And a number of students were also attending schools like Amherst, Harvard, Yale, and Brown. One of his, uh, in this article, Henderson made a bold statement. And the thing that he said here on the first page was, once the Negro is afforded um, access to equal facilities and training, um, whites will find the Negro a, a equal or superior in every athletic endeavor. And I think for 1910, 11, that was a bold statement. He said that because a lot of times during this era of abject segregation, uh, white supremacy thinking made it sound like, particularly in all endeavors that African-Americans were not intelligent enough or brave enough to compete against them. But yet, they, after moving to church, Ned and Nell built this home in 1913 in Falls Church, Virginia. They purchased their home from the 1911 Sears Roebuck catalog. And they spent $1,400. And then the way that it used to be back in those days, it would come by rail. You would get a truck, you would bring it to your lot that you owned, and then you would put it together yourself. I imagine that uh, my grandfather uh, uh, solicited help from the Tenor family who were builders in putting this together. However, he was quite handy himself also. But then soon after, trouble would raise its ugly head. In 1915, a segregation ordinance was proposed. A, but the town council, after hearing um, protests, letter writing, and lawyer's brief in, um, from the NAACP in Washington, D.C., they decided to put the issue to the voters. So there was a referendum vote in the town um, the flyer on the left actually says the town election. The first issue is um, segregation of the town, yes or no. Well, the town voted yes. And after which there was a lawsuit filed against the town of Falls Church in Fairfax County Circuit Court which put an injunction on the enforcement of the, of the ordinance. The colored citizens of the community formed in resistance a group called the Colored Citizens Protective League. And here we have a letter to W.E.B. Du Bois asking to form a branch of the NAACP in Falls Church. Um, the response that came back, and I think we covered this last week, was that there are no rural branches and we fear for your safety. Um, and so the committee, the CCPL, Colored Citizens Protective League, uh, was offered assistance 
with um, the lawyers, which I mentioned previously. And in 1918, the CCPL evolved becoming the first rural branch of the NAACP in the nation. This fight brought Henderson to the forefront of civil rights in Northern Virginia, but also making him a target. Here you see a transcribed letter um, that was signed KKK, uh, but the Henderson's life was in constant danger. He received hate mail such as this letter, prank calls on the telephone all hours of the day and night, and at least once a cross was burned on his lawn. But bravely, he would not deter from seeking justice and equality for his people. In 1922, another further atrocity came when a portion of his land was taken by eminent domain to create a memorial highway for Robert e, General Robert E. Lee. Here you see the engineering map, which shows how they cut the road through the African-American community. This form of injustice was not unusual in those days, though. In addition to writing and teaching, E.B. was also a coach, um, a teach and a referee. Uh, here you see him as he, with the Dunbar High School team, which he coached to a championship in 1922, which starred the, starred the brilliant doctor and scientist who invented the blood bank for the Red Cross, Dr. Charles Drew was in the front there, four from the left, I mean, from the right. In 1926, Henderson becomes the head, the, the director of health, physical education, athletics, and safety in the Washington, D.C. public schools. And he would stay in that role until his retirement in 1954. Boy, they jammed a lot of stuff into one department, health, physical education, athletics, and safety. Wow. In 1939, at the behest of the father of Black history, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the Negro in Sports was first published in 1939. Henderson later revised and expanded the Negro in Sports in 1949. And a lot of that, a lot happened between 39 and 49. Uh, but most importantly, I think people would say that the Jackie Robinson breaking into Major League Baseball was by far the biggest story. Um, this is a letter from Dr. Charles Drew uh, congratulating and praising uh, Henderson for his coaching, teaching, and mentorship on the occasion of the release of Henderson's book, The Negro in Sports. It's quite complimentary, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to uh, spend a lot of time on it, but um, he was, uh, he laid it on pretty heavy, I think, which we appreciate. Then uh, upon his retirement from teaching and stepping down from the directorship of uh, physical education, the Washington Afro-American newspaper did an eight part expose on his life and contributions to Washington, D.C. society. Also in 1954, Henderson forms the first chapter of the, uh, for African Americans of the uh, American Alliance of Physical, of Health, Physical Education, Recreation and Dance which is the National Organization for Professional Physical Educators. It was highly segregated and would not allow African-Americans to join. Although Henderson had submitted articles 
that were published in their journal for decades. He was also honored as a fellow of the organization in 1954, which was actually quite an honor. A lot of the reluctance of the organization to admit African-Americans into their uh, organization was they did not want to alienate white Southerners who made up a large part of the organization. This is very similar to uh, what happened uh, during um, suffrage, the suffrage movement when uh, the women's movement would not allow Ida B. Wells to march with them in the front of the parade and said that they could bring up the rear. Well, and that was because of the same reason, because they did not want to alienate the whites that were in the organization. Unfortunately, that was too often the case during the era of segregation. Also upon his retirement, Henderson was elected as the president of the Virginia Council of the NAACP, which is the state branch where he fought against the massive resistance uh, of the Harry Byrd administration vowing never to um, integrate, or should I say desegregate, the white schools in Virginia. Um, but Henderson felt that it was his duty to fight against that, but also to make sure that divisions throughout Virginia implemented with all deliberate speed the uh, verdict or the decision of Brown versus Board of Education um, that was so eloquently argued before the Supreme Court by Thurgood Marshall. Here on the left, you see E.B. Henderson's, um, this is his retirement portrait. So this is what he looked like in his early 70s. And on the right, you see him, um, this is him leaving actually in 1957. Here's the new president um, here, and here's the, President Emeritus. This is the uh, newsletter for the state organization. It is better to light a can one candle than the cursed darkness. E.B. Henderson also, uh, th with the within the structure of the Fairfax County NAACP, fought hard also to desegregate the schools in Fairfax County. He was instrumental in tearing down the walls of segregation in public schools in Virginia, even after leading the state NAACP to desegregate public education in Fairfax County. Here you see on the right, a Washington Post article from 1959 about a lawsuit um, by 26 African-American students. This was mostly orchestrated by the, or through the Fairfax NAACP, where they were carrying, after, uh, in 1960, there was a, a federal judge that ruled that the plan of the Fairfax County Public Schools to integrate one grade a year was much too gradual and was not acceptable under the edict of the Brown versus Board of Education to desegregate with all um, deliberate speed. So in 1959, or should I say in 1960, 61 school year, um, African-Americans were able to put in place around 30 or in his 26 uh, African-American students into white schools 
and they use pupil placement. In other words, they signed up and they placed them in these white schools. The next year, there was 100. The following year, 214. The following year, over 400. And so the, the year after that, in other words, the 1965-66 school year, the schools just said, well, we see where this is going. So let's just go ahead and comply with the rule, the decision in Brown versus Board of Education. So the school year of 1965-66 was the first school year um, in Fairfax County uh, that schools were totally integrated, except for my grandmother's school, which they completely shut down, the James Lee Elementary School. And then in uh, Christmas Eve, 1960, uh, Ned and Nell were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. And you see their two sons on the, on the left, you see my father, James, or Jimmy Henderson, who was a biomedical researcher at Tuskegee Institute. And on the right, you see um, Edwin Merriweather Henderson, my uncle Ed, who was a dentist in Washington, DC. Um, the children in the picture, you see, uh, I am sitting on my grandfather's lap, which was actually uh, a lot of pictures I find that I'm sitting on my grandfather's lap, at least until I was probably way too much to, to sit there any longer. And you see my brother and sisters and my mother up above my father, uh, Betty Francis Henderson. Then in 1965, um, Old Warrior Against Segregation Leaving Field at 82. Um, my grandparents decided that they would leave the area and come and live with my father in Tuskegee, Alabama. And um, so he lived in this home for 52 years here in Falls Church. Um, I'm the current owner of the house and I have uh, spent a lot of time trying to preserve the home as well as his legacy. There was a slower pace in Alabama. And um, one, the first thing that he did once he got there, he organized a branch of the NAACP there as well. But he continued to write his letters to the editor of which he wrote over 3,000 during his lifetime, most of them published in the Washington Post. And he also continued to write. In 1969, with the um, um, assistance of Sports Magazine, uh, he published with the, in the International Library of Negro Life and History, um, the, the Black Athlete. And so this would be his final book, which he wrote. And then uh, in 1974, E.B. was inducted into the first class of the Black Athletes Hall of Fame, along with the likes of Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali, Bill Russell, and Jim Brown. So he was in very good company, but what this also shows is the high regard in which he was held at that time. Anytime you can say in the same, uh, you're in a list with Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali, Bill Russell, and Jim Brown, you're in good company. And a lot of the time, uh, he, he built this home here in um, Highland Beach, Maryland. Um, and this was his getaway spot um, 
while he lived here. And even in his retirement, you know, he spent the summers at this home. It was a summer cottage. Um, he spent much of his spare time in the summer cottage. He named it Loafing Holt after a poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Highland Beach, Maryland is the oldest African-American resort community in the entire nation. And he led the effort to incorporate the town, the community as a town in 1922 and was elected its first mayor. Um, they felt that incorporation of the town helped them to have more control of their environment and their resources. People would often see him in the evenings casting his surf fishing poles off the banks of the Chesapeake Bay and smoking his signature con cob corn, corn cob pipe, which you see in his mouth there. And he would catch as big a fish as the people that went out on their boats, I dare say. Up in years, um, this is around 1976, uh, one final article in the Washington Post, NAACP Pioneers recalls in 92, the milestones. Um, it, the love of his life, Nell, had a stroke in Highland Beach in 1976, and she entered into a nursing home uh, on Wisconsin Avenue in, in DC. EB um, also went into the nursing home so that he could be with her and spend time with her, even though she was basically in a coma the whole time. And she died um, February 4th, 1976. So it was 1975 that she had the stroke. And in 76, uh, February 4th, she passed away. Uh, EB uh, went back to Tuskegee, but uh, after you've been married to somebody for 66 years, you know, it was very difficult for him. And he basically um, um, mourned himself to death. He did uh, have an operation, colon cancer, which they took out portions of his colon and he was in great pain. And then he was admitted to the hospital in um, Tuskegee um, the last three weeks of his life. Um, he passed away on February 3rd of 1977, one year less than a year, one day less than a year after his dear Nell passed away. But still, a lot of honors were still starting to come to him. A lot of it started to happen after we uh, submitted the um, nomination for the Basketball Hall of Fame. During February of uh, 2010, uh, there's a, in the Washington Post, I'm not sure if it's the kids section, um, but there was a cartoon, a weekly cartoon that was published, the flashbacks cartoons that were um, done by Patrick Reynolds. And uh, there were four segments and it had to do with, uh, it was a cartoon that highlighted Henderson's contributions to Washington DC and to uh, physical education, athletics and basketball. Later that year in 2010, uh, my wife and I um, were able to collaborate with the Smithsonian 
Howard University and the National YMCA under the auspices of the Tenehill Heritage Foundation to um, put on a, a national conference of the emergence and legacy of black basketball. And uh, it was a big success. And you see the picture here done um, of EB was done by a man named Mark Chiarillo, who is better known for his Negro Leagues baseball cards um, that he produced. But still, I think it's a striking portrait of EB. And this is the poster. Um, uh, Mr. Chiarillo also gave us the portrait that he made that we made this poster out of. And then in 2013, our bid to um, get E.B. Henderson into the Basketball Hall of Fame became a reality. And here you see um, my wife Nikki and I holding the Basketball Hall of Fame statue in Springfield, Massachusetts at the Basketball Hall of Fame uh, ceremony. And I think that's it. Oh, no, one more. In 2021, a Virginia State Historic Marker was installed at the home of Dr. Edwin Bancroft Henderson at Falls Church. It highlights more basketball, but it also includes uh, the NAACP pursuits as well. This was actually done through a, a program in the schools that was started by Governor Northam to, uh, as, as a competition for students to create a roadside marker such as this. And there was a young man from um, Springfield, uh, uh, Springfield, Virginia, <laughs> that wrote this up and it was accepted. So I have to give him credit. Uh, Sully Sullivan Morano, I, I may have messed up his name. Sully uh, wrote this up, it, it, it was accepted. It won uh, the competition and the Virginia Department of Historic Resources made this marker, roadside marker. And today it stands at 307 South Maple Avenue in the city of Falls Church. And that is the end of the show. <laughs> Edwin, it's Trudy. Um, first of all, wow. <laughs> Second of all, Thank you for not only preserving this history, but sharing it with us today. I am completely in awe um, and amazed. Um, one of the first questions we had is, um, did you play basketball? <laughs> I played on a couple of uh, uh, junior varsity teams. I wasn't very good. I'm not very tall. Uh, and so my sport of uh, endeavor was more football and soccer. Oh, and tennis. I love <laughs> tennis. And um, I probably played more tennis than anything. But um, basketball was, I don't have the physicality to be of, of interest to anybody as a basketball player. <laughs> 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 okay. What would you say is the, the greatest influence that your grandfather had on your life? Um, the greatest influence that he had on my life was a love for history and African-American history in particular. Also, I would say, uh, um, I mean, being that we always spent our summers and he spent his summers in Highland Beach. Um, love for water sport and nature um, were also a big uh, influence that he had on me as well. Very good. 
Um, I have a question asking where and when did uh, your grandfather get his doctorate? Okay. He was called Dr. Henderson in large part because he was a doctor of chiropractic. He was not able to become an MD, which he wanted to do, which I think I mentioned. And um, in his 60s, he did get his master's from Columbia and he had 26 credits or 15 credits towards his doctorate. But at 60, it was a little bit um, beyond being necessary. And too many other things I think were pressing other than that pursuit. And we have a guest that wants to know if the summer cottage is still in your family. <laughs> the property um, is belongs to my uncle Ed's widow, but the home, as charming as it was, was not practical <laughs> for his use, and he tore it down and built a more modern structure. <laughs> uh, my mother's family owned a summer cottage as well. Uh, right on the Chesapeake Bay. And that property is still in my family. That uh, was a summer home that I spent all of my summers growing up at. But today it is the primary residence of my sister, my favorite sister who I go to visit often. <laughs> Very good. Um, you mentioned, we saw the, the, uh, the, the letter and the, the threats. Did the family ever come to any harm during the era of segregation? Um, there were close calls. There uh, was supposedly a file of around 100 pieces of hate mail. But... Um, I have yet to see those. It's mentioned in his writing uh, in, from 1965 when he published A History of the Fairfax County NAACP. Um, there was an incident uh, anecdotally that I heard about when he arrived home and found um, my grandmother and the children underneath the house shivering. Um, I believe that was probably the same time that uh, the crosses were being burned in the yard. Um, there was also a article in a Washington newspaper about him uh, wanting to um, get a pistol. And so he went to the, the sheriff and he asked for a permit to have a pistol. And the sheriff said, sure, and I hope you you plug one of them too. Um, but there was a lot of uh, parades and, and other uh, KKK activity in particularly in the Boston area. And then there was a, what's that guy named Rockwell who was the American Nazi party um, who had a headquarters and home on um, Wilson Boulevard. Um, one thing that he did stop doing, he had to change, was he, at first, when he moved out here, he was catching the, the trolley into town. You know, there was a station here. And um, he stopped riding the trolley and decided that he would drive in. And that way he could control his transportation and, um, and have his pistol with him. <laughs> you know, but, you know, he was not about to be intimidated. And um, so, but no physical, he was thrown off the bus one time uh, coming from, coming across Key Bridge, because in Washington, he, you could sit anywhere. But once you got into Virginia, uh, you had to go to the back of the bus and he refused and he was thrown off. And that was a fight in the 40s about interstate, interstate transportation. And uh, there was a um, 
I think a uh, Supreme Court decision on that in 1946. And so other than that, I can't, uh, I don't know of any real harm that came to him or my family, but I'm sure there was harassments and insults and other things which they had to endure. I have one comment before I turn the program back over to Suba. We have a guest in the audience that says she remembers Mr. Henderson. She grew up in Falls Church and was in the group who in 1963 entered Falls Church High and attended James Lee Elementary. And you have stirred up so many memories for her. Well, that's- Thank uh, you, Edwin. That. Thank you. Okay, uh, Suba, back to you. Oh, yeah, I, that was amazing, Edwin. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. I, I, I do have a couple of questions, though. You mentioned that I didn't know there was a Black Athletes Hall of Fame, which I learned about today. Where would that be? Is there a location for it? Well, it, it, it went under. Um, it, it didn't last. Okay. Um, they, uh, the, the ceremony was at the uh, Americana Hotel in New York City. Okay. Um, and so I, I don't know that there was ever a permanent um, facility where uh, things were kept. Okay. The Basketball Hall of Fame, I have several letters between the Basketball Hall of Fame and my grandfather wanting artifacts, wanting a book. Uh, they wanted the first edition copy. I think my, father, my grandfather told him that he didn't have enough of them and he didn't have one that he wanted to give away. <laughs> and the thing that they said was they could not tell the story of the beginnings of basketball among African-Americans without his book. And, you know, uh, and the thing about it is the Spalding Manual handbook was probably a, a um, would have been a better um, instrument to tell the story of how African Americans started playing basketball, but those uh, are like hen's teeth. You won't find many of them. Uh, the Library of Congress digitally has all four years, 19, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Um, but you won't find many of them, and I have uh, uh, most of them. I, I think there's one year I don't have. But, um, and the, well, um, that, that book is, uh, or booklet, should I say, handbook, um, is by far the, one of the most rare and treasured um, chroniclings of African-American participating in sports. Okay, um, and I wanted to make sure I got this right. The marker that you have on the slide right here, it's located for the people in the local area in Virginia. It's on 307 South Maple Avenue in Falls Church. That is correct. Okay, that's one place I'm going to definitely. Uh, so the last question I have is besides the historical marker for your grandfather, is there a statue of him anywhere or what was named after him, like any buildings and anything like that? <laughs> ah, glad you asked that question. Um, and I was just up there at the University of District of Columbia earlier today for the um, Channel 7 WJLA's uh, Black History Month. They did a recording uh, this morning for Good Morning Washington and uh, the University of the District of Columbia, which originally was Minor Teachers College where E.B. Henderson attended and got his first college degree. They are proposing, and they're very excited about it, um, naming the sports facility on campus after Dr. Henderson, and they are um, going to build a statue of him. They haven't determined who will do the statue. The Hall of Fame uh, 
always ask that a statue be built, but uh, they have no money to assist in its being built. So it's up to, and many of these NBA uh, uh, stars who are inducted into all of them, they can pay for it all themselves. Yes. But, you know, um, I'm, I'm not them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that we're going to get um, enough to build the statue and hopefully get started on it um, very soon. Uh, there will be a ceremony um, which will unveil the sign with his name on it on the building on February 19th on the campus of the University District of Columbia. And that will be live streamed on the, um, on the university webpage. Additionally, there is a facility that's dedicated in its honor. And um, that is the Providence Rec Center here in uh, Fairfax County Park Authority. And um, I was able uh, to get a banner that was produced by the, the Library of Virginia that honored him in 2018. And they're gonna hang that in the um, rec center. Um, it should be up by Thursday in honor, of, in honor of Black History Month. But what I've always been telling them is that in 1982, if you dedicated uh, this to E.B. Henderson, uh, surely it's time to put his name on the building. <laughs> yes, I agree. Well, thank you, Edwin. Um, so uh, on behalf of ARP Virginia, I uh, certainly like to thank you for sharing this valuable time and knowledge with us this afternoon. Normally, I'm supposed to say something personal I learned. I learned a lot of things today. It was just amazing. Um, and um, anyway, folks, we'd love to get your feedback on today's program and ideas for future programs. In the chat box, you'll see a link that Amber has already put up on the survey. Please click on the link and take a few moments to share your feedback with us. We'll also send this link in our follow-up email later today. Uh, we invite you to continue to celebrate Black History Month with us, our Tuesday Explorers programs in February will focus on the rich contributions of African-Americans to our local communities and beyond. Next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we'll be joined by Professor Gregory S. Cook, a career educator, documentary filmmaker, and World War II historian, who is dedicated to helping relocate African-Americans from the margins to the main pages of American and global history. Specifically, he will talk about the hidden figures who courageously triumphed over racism and sexism during World War II. You might have heard of Rosie the Riveter. Well, these are the Rosie the Riveters that were never talked about. In the chat box, you'll see a link to register for th these and other Black History Month programs. Um, until next time, we encourage you to stay curious and keep exploring. And um, Edwin, once again, you had a lot of glowing comments in the chat. We, uh, we hope this is not the only time we see you. We hopefully that will, well, I'll keep on advocating to get you back again for ARP. I, uh, I really enjoyed it today and I hope uh, you'll be back with us. And uh, sir, I salute you for what you and your uh, family have done. Thank you. Thank you.